strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in In Christ alone, you took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross as Jesus died, the On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I lay. There in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of
Good morning, church. Once again, what a joy it is to be able to worship the Lord today. And though we may be physically separated, we can be united together in praising His name, in worshiping Him, and in lifting up our voices in prayer to our God. So church, let's all bow our heads together and pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy and a privilege it is to be able to come together and just lift up our voices aloud to you, knowing that you always hear us. The psalmist proclaims that in the day of our trouble, we will seek you. When we remember you, we moan. When we meditate, our spirit faints. And when we are so troubled that we cannot even speak, we will remember you. In songs, our spirit will search for you and we will remember the great deeds you have already done. Father, we remember when the waters saw you and were afraid, when the clouds poured out water and the skies gave forth thunder, when your lightning lit up the world and the earth trembled and shook. Surely, Lord, you are great and deserving of all honor, glory, majesty, and praise. So we thank you, for you are mindful of us, that you formed us in your own image, that you loved us even while we were still sinners. We thank you that for these few moments, we can be still and just acknowledge your steadfast love, your graciousness, and your compassion. Lord, even now, so many of our countrymen are suffering from the effects of COVID and even from the effects of Typhoon Roli. And even all over the world, Lord, so much pain and so much suffering is being encountered so far this year. And so, Lord, we just want to pray for those who are suffering. Lord, so many are feeling alone, feeling isolated, feeling abandoned by you. Father, send them comfort. Send them relief, send them peace, and we pray, Father, that you also provide for their material needs, for food, clothing, shelter, drinking water, electricity, even communication needs. Lord, hear their cries of agony and spurn them not. Your compassion never fades. They are new every morning great is your faithfulness father and we thank you for your unending faithfulness to us here to your church here gcf makati we thank you for keeping all of us safe throughout these past eight months and for sending your provision for all of those who need it for sending a helping hand a listening ear even medicines and gadgets to those who need it Lord, allow us always to be sensitive to the needs of our brothers and sisters and soften our hearts to be just as the first church was, sharing all that we have so that none may be in need. Father, whenever we look back at this time, we will remember your great faithfulness. Help us, Lord, to use this, this suffering that we're going through Help us to use the love that you are showing us to be your faithful witnesses also to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, you are our shepherd. And though your footsteps may not be seen at times, still you lead us like a flock. And we just once again want to worship you, honor you, praise you, and thank you. Father, we lift up to you, Pastor Rolivik and Pam. 
may you continue to empower them to be your faithful ministers to your flock here at GCF Makati. Keep them always so in tune, so in love with you, that not only will they faithfully preach your word, but that they will always be passionate, precious, pressing, pastoral, and perennial witnesses of your great love. We lift them up to you, as well as the rest of our worship service this morning, and we pray all these things in the matchless name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. So our scripture reading for today is Revelation chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Revelation chapter 16 Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the author saying, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched with the fierce heat. And they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And they saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits, performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the world, to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. 
and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found, and great hailstones, about one hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to our online worship service here at GCF Makati. If this is your first time to be joining us for worship, my name is Rolivik. In behalf of our whole church family, just want to welcome you to GCF Makati. We are so happy that you could join us today. And I pray that the Lord would bless you as we study the word of the Lord. And I pray that you would consider GCF Makati also as your spiritual home. I'd like to thank everyone who had participated in our time of worship this morning. Thank you, Yen, for leading us in, in praise and worship thank you for the diligence that you have put into recording um, that, that those songs you know, that we have sung a while ago thank you also brother Sieg uh, Bascasio for helping us arrange uh, the video thank you for all the efforts you put there as well uh, thank you for our team of scripture readers thank you Deb and thank you Jamie for reading the scripture uh, for us this morning and thank you Deacon Ken for leading us in prayer you know we have a lot to talk about this morning and so before we get started let's join our hearts in prayer our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies. Thank you, Lord, because you are always just and you are always true. And so today, Lord, we ask that you would bless our time together in your word. Lord, help us to see uh, uh, an, accurate uh, an accurate picture of who you are right now, not only in your mercy, but also in your justice and wrath. Lord, this is a difficult topic right now, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would just cancel out every work of the evil one lord to distract us lord to to threaten us lord and to really um, lead our attentions away from you this morning lord we submit to you O holy spirit our minds our affections and our wills would you take them captive would you take away everything that is off me O lord and just retain everything that is off you we long to commune with the lord and so you are our pastor our leader and our guide would you direct us to Jesus? And would you receive all the glory that's due your name as we study your word this morning? We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know um, if this was the case with you uh, this week as well, but I have been following the U.S. elections uh, very obsessively uh, this whole week. I've been I've been online uh, watching the live streams and um, this live updates about what's going on uh, in the presidential elections in the in the states. And, and this one is, is it's really special, no? Because the election is really right down the middle. Um, both parties are digging deep in their political. Conditions. Convictions, no, and, and really, um, and really standing their ground, no, and so uh, everyone is uh, hanging on a thread, just really anxious to know who the next president of the U.S. would be. Uh, but then it's um, it, it as I, I see this update, so there are many protests and and uh, allegations of corruption and fraud, no, and uh, and it's just getting ugly. And I realize that this situation um, is not just isolated to the states. We here in the Philippines, we have this right. Every political season, right? Every political election is it's like this, and um, it, it's it's just rampant the, the injustice and just the ugliness of of people just uh, being harsh to one another and and i'm wondering when when all of these things would be um, put to an end and as we come to the word of the lord uh, this morning we get to realize that you know what there are a lot of things that are bad in our world today 
It's just a lot of ugliness, a lot of sin, and a lot of evil. But you know what? If you if you just summarize everything that's been read to us this morning, you know, at a certain point in time, the Lord would just come again and say, enough, enough. He would put an end to all of this and just say, enough. And the Lord would bring justice. The Lord would bring justice to this world and He would put an end to all sin and all evil and all suffering and He would just say, enough. Today, I would like for us to understand and have a heavenly perspective about the wrath of God. Heavenly perspective about the wrath of God when God says enough. So it's it's so easy and so appealing to talk about the righteousness and so appealing to talk about the grace and the kindness of God, right? And these are very comforting to us. But most of the time, this very important doctrine, this very important truth about God's divine wrath and justice is left to the sidelines, particularly because it makes us uncomfortable. But you know what? If we do not understand the wrath of God, then we would never understand His grace and His mercy. And so we turn to the Bible today and we want to learn five things about the wrath of God. Again, these are heavenly perspectives about the wrath of God. Five things I would like for us to talk about this morning. Uh, The fullness of God's glory, the finished work of Christ, freedom through Christ, a faithfulness of God's justice, and the foolishness of rebellion. So once again, the the fullness of God's glory a finished work of Christ, the freedom through Christ, the faithfulness of God's justice, and the foolishness of rebellion. And the first one is the fullness of God's glory. Fullness of God's glory. So Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 4 says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Verse 5, After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels uh, were finished. So we are noticing as we have uh, gone through the book of Revelation that there is a big distinction here in this book between the people who dwell on this earth and the people who make their dwelling with God. You know, we, we made the illustration a couple of weeks ago, just like uh, Joshua in the time of Jericho, right? And there are people in, inside of Jericho who are just against God, and there are people of God who are marching around Jericho because God is coming and taking over uh, the city of Jericho. In, in the same way, in this world, there are, there are people who have been really who have been really captivated by the glory of God and because seeing uh, the worth of God, they willingly surrender their life to God. And, and these people are people who, who go through a tremendous season of tribulation and trial, but, that, but at the end, no, they, they come out praising the Lord and glorifying the name of the Lord. In the same way, there are people also in this world who just bets on this world. And for them, this is it. They make their commitment and allegiance to this world. And and as a result of that, uh, they are antagonistic to God. They make an enemy out of God. Ironically, in this world, they're very happy. Um, they're very comfortable in this world. But then, at the end, you know, they would come out very miserable and 
they would go through a time of tribulation uh, like there's never been in this world. So the book of Revelation makes that distinction and the point of that distinction is the glory of God. So when you talk about the wrath of God, the wrath of God comes precisely from God's glory and from God's holiness. God's wrath is not just God losing his temper. No, it's very different from human wrath. When, when we are wrathful as human beings, when, when we are angry, we lose control. No, It's a difference between a machine gun or, or shotgun, I should say a shotgun, and, and, a, and a sniper rifle. When we get angry, it's more like a shotgun. One shot, it goes many places, diba? Right? And so you would notice that, you know, if you are married, sometimes you get into a disagreement with your spouse, no? And um, you're tempted to be hysterical, but also historical, no? You're angry, you're making an outburst, and you are drawing from a lot of sources, no? And, and you're losing control of your mind and your emotions. That's normally how human beings... Um, exercise their anger and wrath but god is is different he is more like a sniper rifle because his wrath is really targeted you know he, he does not lose control but his wrath is very deadly it's, it's very precise it's very targeted you know god's wrath the wrath of god is god's holiness manifesting a seething anger against sin and evil seething anger coming from the holiness and glory of God because God is worthy to be praised and he alone is holy God cannot stand evil because evil and sin is against him and God is deliberate no wherever sin is his wrath would follow and, and really the point there is you know as human beings uh, to whom do we ascribe glory to whom do we ascribe glory? And really, the root word of glory is weight. Weight, my begat. No, my begat. What holds weight in our life? Because the thing that holds the most weight in our life, that's the thing that we glorify. Yun yung mabigat sa atin. Ah, here's another way of saying it. Um, my science teacher says that matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. No, So the thing that matters most to you is the thing that occupies the most space and the most mass in your life. Yun yung pinaka mabigat. And so when you are in the point of decision, no option A and option B, and when it seems like uh, it's an equal decision, you, bo- you, 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 you make your decision out of what matters most to you. You make that decision. Ano ba ang may halaga sa'yo? Ano ba yung may bigat sa'yo? What matters most in your life? And the thing is, uh, the thing that we should ask ourselves is that, you know, does God occupy the most space and is He the one that has the most weight in our life? Does He matter in our life? And notice the words of um, of the Apostle Paul no, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. It says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who, be, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Why? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And here's the thing, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because there it is again, they exchanged the truth of truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So remember last week, no, we talked about how the evil one makes counterfeit gods, no, in the form of the Antichrist and the false prophet. It's just a counterfeit trinity and that is the way that he leads us away from the lord that he would make counterfeit pleasures uh, counterfeit glories and counterfeit 
uh, points of um, allegiances for us that, that really draws us away from the one who matters most, God, to things that doesn't matter at all compared to God. And we end up exchanging God for things that are counterfeit. Um, we exchange the creator for the created. And no wonder we are living such lives that are empty and meaningless. Remember what Paul says, Romans 1, uh, verse 18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and, and ungodliness of man. It is revealed. You know, We are studying right now how it will be revealed in the end times. But also during this time, the wrath of God is being revealed because God, our Lord, is really against ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. Because even creation is explicit. It is obvious that God is the one that matters most. Without God, there will be no sunshine. Without God, there will be no rain. Without God, there won't be any air. Without God, there won't be any beauty and there will be no reason to live. It is just obvious. Look at the things that are around us. But because our hearts are so dull, we are so blind to the things that are around us, we end up exchanging what matters most, the thing that is most glorious, to the things that does not matter at all. And because we do that, God says, you know what? Here's how God's wrath is manifested. If you want to have that as the most valuable thing in your life, then have that without me. He hands them over to the lusts of their heart. Remember Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7? This is how God revealed himself uh, to Moses when, when Moses asked God to allow him to see the glory of God, to see who God is, and, and really experience the weight of God. This is how God responded to Moses. Exodus uh, 34, verse 6 and 7, uh, God says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. We love this passage because it tells us that God is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is keeping steadfast love to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We love that part. It gives us comfort, right? But there's a big difference between slow to anger and not getting angry. Because in the same passage where it says to us that the Lord is slow to anger, it also tells us that God will by no means clear the guilty. He will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. God's wrath, my friends, will always follow sin and evil. God had made a deliberate decision to be angry at sin, to oppose sin, and to oppose the evil one in all of his works. And God's wrath will follow sin wherever it goes. Sometimes we think that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament, where in the Old Testament we see really God in His wrath, in tearing down kingdoms, in really judging even His people, um, the Israelite nation, no? And we say, you know, the New Testament is different because in the New Testament we see Jesus and it's all about grace, it's all about forgiveness. And then we come to the book of Revelation. We come to the book of Revelation and we realize that from Genesis and up to that point, the beginning of Revelation, God has been really slow to anger. These manifestations of His wrath, well, these are, this are means by God to draw us to Him. He's giving us time to repent. You know, th these are 
pictures and glimpses of the anger of God towards sin. But you know what? At the end, God would say enough. With finality, he would put an end to all sin because God will constantly follow sin and unrighteousness and ungodliness and evil wherever it goes. So that's a warning to us. The Bible says that sin will be hunted by God even on our children to the third and the fourth generation. You know what that means? Because a life of sin is contagious. When we live a life of sin, we, live, we lead our families in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord. Our children would learn from us. They would inherit our sin. The, the, the sins of their fathers would be handed towards them because they're learning from us. And you know what? If we don't get right with Jesus... God would follow us in his wrath, but even our children to the third and fourth generation. But the, but the promise here is in the same way that God would execute his judgment over sin. He would say enough. It reminds us that God forgives iniquity. He forgives iniquity. So remember that the wrath of God is coming from the fullness of God's glory because God matters most, right? He is against the things that does not matter at all. And God would follow sin wherever it goes, but God still forgives. God still forgives. And the, and the place that you would see the fullness of God's forgiveness and the fullness of God's wrath interact with one another is on the cross of Jesus Christ as we behold his finished work. The cross is that point in history where, where God's wrath would meet God's grace and forgiveness. And John, I believe, is touching on that point. Because this is how he begins Revelation chapter 15. John says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. Why? For with them the wrath of God is finished. With these plagues, the wrath of God is finished. Yusuf Makati? What does that phrase remind you of? The wrath of God is finished. I believe it is no coincidence that the writer of the book of Revelation is the same as the writer of the Gospel of John. Because it is John who records for us these last words from Jesus on the cross. John 9, 28 to 30. After, Je after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Tetelestai. It's the same word, actually, that John uses in Revelation chapter 15. It is finished. So Jesus drank that sour wine and he said on the cross as he was dying, It is finished. You see the imagery here and the words here? Drinking. In declaring it is finished. Later on in this passage, we would find that the people who are in rebellion against God would drink the fullness of the wrath of God. But on the cross, as Jesus held that sour wine in his mouth, he declared it is finished. Now what is that sour wine? What is that cup? Remember, during uh, Jesus' last night, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember this, this uh, scenario, this story from Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 44. Let me read it to you. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. 
And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. What is this cup that Jesus was praying about? What was this cup was, that was giving Jesus profound sorrow and trouble that, that Luke says to us that Jesus was sweating blood? Such trouble was in Jesus' heart. What was this cup? You know, the cup that Jesus was praying for there, that would be taken away from him, was the cup of the fury of God's wrath. Notice Jesus' prayer, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You know what? That cup did not pass from Jesus. Meaning to say, there is no other way. There is no other way for God to deal with sin and death than to execute His wrath on His Son. Jesus prayed for the second time, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So think about this. Think about this. God had made a deliberate decision. God is eternally angry at sin and evil. But yet God is forgiving. So what does God do? How can He be just in giving his justice in the form of wrath towards sin and be forgiving and merciful towards people. How can he do that? Here's how he does it. God himself takes on human form. God sends his son and he incurs the wrath of God on the cross. The cup did not pass from Jesus. On the cross, as we have sung a while ago, on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On Him was laid. Here, on the death of Christ, I live. On the cross, Jesus hung there. He was thirsty. He was emptied out. His blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. He says, I thirst. The soldiers took a sponge, put it on a hyssop branch, dipped it in sour wine, and held it to Jesus' mouth. You know that sponge there is the same sponge that they use to clean themselves after they use the toilet. Such was the filth of that sponge. It was held to Jesus' mouth. He incurred on him the totality of our filth and the consequence for our sin. The Bible says the wages for sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin. One sin is death. The wages of one solitary sin is the wrath of God. But on the cross, Jesus took it all. The wages of one sin is death. How many sins do we commit in a day? How many sins do we commit in a lifetime? Can you imagine the whole weight of that sin before a holy God? It deserves nothing. Nothing short of condemnation and wrath. That's the only thing that we deserve from the Lord. But on the cross, God was forgiving. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He gave a provision for our sin. More than a provision, He gave a substitute for our sin. Jesus hung on the cross so that we won't need to be hung on the cross. Jesus incurred the wrath of God so that we might be saved from the wrath of God. 
So whenever you think about the wrath of God, you think about the glory of God, but you also think about the finished work on, of God through Christ on the cross because Jesus says it is finished. Because He incurred the wrath of God, there is no more wrath for you to take if you are under His protection and care. Would you give your life to Jesus at this moment? Would you surrender your life to Jesus at this moment? Remember, the wages of one sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a gift, meaning to say you can receive it right now. You can receive it right now. In Christ, through Christ, there is freedom. And notice here that the people who have been saved are singing a song. John says, And I saw what appeared to be a glass of, uh, uh, to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing as the song of Moses, the servant of God, in the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name for you alone are holy all nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed my friends you know what the lord the lord paid the penalty of our sins so that we might be free to worship him the Lord did not die on the cross just for us to, to be comfortable, not just for us to go to heaven. He died on the cross so that you and I might have reason to worship Him forever. Notice the lyrics of this song. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you are, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed the passage today says that they were singing the song of moses you know when when moses led the people out of egypt into the promised land and they crossed the red sea after they have crossed the red sea they came out singing this is the song that they sang exodus 15 1 to 6 then moses and the people of israel sang the song to the lord saying i will sing to the lord for he has triumphed gloriously the host and his rider he has thrown into the sea the lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation this is my god and i will praise him my father's god and i will exalt him the lord is a man of war the lord is his name pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the red sea the floods covered them they went down into the depths like a stone your right hand O lord glorious in power your right hand O lord shatters the enemy verse 11 who is like you O lord among the gods who is like you majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretch out your hand, your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to be to your holy abode. You know, the whole reason why, why the Lord led His people out of Egypt into across the Red Sea, into the Promised Land, so that they can worship Him. Uh, this, notice, uh, you know, when Moses confronted Pharaoh, this is what he said, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. The whole point of redemption is to make a people who are worshippers of God. We ought to be people who are worshiping God. So uh, together with the song of Moses, they also sang the song of the Lamb, remember? And uh, this is the song of the Lamb. We have, we have talked about it from Revelation 5, 9 to 10. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Romans 12 1 uh, says that in view of God's mercies, uh, we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. This is our spiritual act of worship. That's the whole point of redemption. God died on the cross for us so that we might in turn worship God and give our lives to Him. Uh, Rome, Galatians 5 1 says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. 
Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Because it is the case, my, my, my friends, that sometimes we forget the mercies of the Lord. We are saved from the wrath of God, but the moment we encounter a snag in our life, we hanker back uh, to, the, to the things that made the slaves in the first place. Just like the Israelites, after they crossed the Red Sea, they encountered the problem there was no water in the wilderness. What, what, what was the first thing in their minds? We, we want to return to Egypt. The same thing is true with us. But remember, the Lord has set us free. It is for freedom. He wants us to be free to worship Him. And so we should stand and do not, we should not allow ourselves to submit again to a yoke of slavery. And it is so, so easy to do that. Remember the churches to whom the revelation was addressed to? The Ephesians for, has forgotten their first love. The Laodiceans became lukewarm. The people in Thyatira has succumbed to sexual immorality. Sardis to, to a life of hypocrisy. They have a reputation of being alive but dead. It is so easy to go back to the things that has enslaved us. But remember, God has set us free so that we might be people who are worshippers of Him. We are supposed to be worshipers of God. And you know what? When we worship God, when we give our lives to God, we make a stand against the evil one. We declare war against the evil one in the world and the flesh. And in turn, you know, the evil one, the world and the flesh, declares war against us as well. But we have to be reminded of the faithfulness of God's justice. Because as we follow the Lord in this world, we will encounter trials and tribulations. Certainly the people at this time um, did encounter that. So last week we talked about the Antichrist and the challenge here. Uh, Revelation uh, 13 verse 10, sabe, If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Endurance and faith are absolutely essential if we are to be worshippers of the Lord. Why? Because we are going through severe trials and tribulation. Now, I don't know what position you have uh, regarding the tribulation no? in the book of Revelation. You can be pre-tribulation, meaning to say that the Lord would rapture His church before tribulation or mid-tribulation, that He would take His church in the midst of tribulation, or you can be post-tribulation, or after the tribulation, the Lord will take His church. Either way, the book of Revelation makes a distinction between the Lord, the, thing, the, the people the Lord protects and the people who are just rebellious against the Lord. But but regardless of our position regarding suffering, no, uh, the point of the matter is that suffering would come. The passage says, If anyone is to be taken captive, to, the, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Uh, you, you remember, no, um, as the fifth seal was broken by, by, by the Lamb no, in Revelation chapter 6, uh, John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. So what does this mean? It means you no, know, regardless of what our view of tribulation is, in one form or another, we will go through a time of suffering and trial. Surely we are going through one now in this pandemic, this political environment, all the hatred in this world, all the, all the struggles in, in this kingdom of this world. And so the call of the Lord is to persevere. We have to persevere with the assurance that at a certain point in time, the Lord will say enough. God is faithful in giving justice. God is faithful. He's giving us time to repent right now, but the Lord will act and the Lord will come and save us. Revelation 16, 1-7 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. 
So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was. For you brought these judgment, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord, God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. You know, one of the distressing things that I have noticed even right now as I'm um, paying attention to the elections in the States, you know, and how how many Christians, evangelicals even, just like us, have been provoked to much hatred, no? Um, and really even to the point of being harsh towards other people because of this seeming persecution uh, that they are going through in their lives. No, I, I just remember uh, uh, this quote I've quoted last week from Eugene uh, Peterson from Reverse Thunder. He said, When we live in a world of violence long enough, it is easy to adopt violent means ourselves, especially when we know that our case is righteous and the opposition is evil. Religious faith, especially when zealous, is no stranger to the ex- exercise of violent force. Killing the opposition is the sea beast's way of solving his problem. It is not ours. Ours is endurance and faith. Now, no, the, the church is called to struggle, no, and even to the point of laying their lives for the Lord. And, and the question here is how long, no? The saints have been crying, how long, or Lord, no? Lord naman, gano katagal? How long must we endure all of these things? The comfort in this passage is that, you know, God is faithful in His justice. The Lord is just. He would not let the guilty go unpunished. And so, the comfort, Romans 12, uh, 19 to 21, gives us this instruction, no? Uh, it says, a beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, because God is faithful in giving justice, we could relinquish our lives to his hands. We can be loving at the expense of being hurt because we know that God is just. He'll take care of us. There's meaning to our lives. God would vindicate His name. No? So that's the faithfulness of God's justice. Because God is faithful in giving justice, all of these plagues towards those who are in opposition to Him, no? Receiving the mark of the beast. It is really foolish to be in rebellion against God. The foolishness of rebellion. Let me read to you uh, the following passage. Uh, Revelation 16, 8 to 16. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out this bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays away, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Remember how I illustrated the evil one last week as Wiley Coyote? Remember Wiley Coyote? He is constantly pursuing the roadrunner um, to no avail. The thing that's about Wiley Coyote that, that really intrigues me is that he is a 
big fan of Acme products. No, he, he sources all of his um, traps and all of his rockets and his bombs uh, from Acme. But every time, it proves faulty. But that does not stop him from buying stuff from Acme again and again and again, though it is faulty. And, and, and I use that illustration because from that passage, that's exactly what we see about the foolishness about rebellion against God. God is just pouring out His wrath against people who are rebelling against Him. And though it is obvious, people did not repent. They cursed God. And even to the point of rallying together the armies of the world to make war against God. You realize how how ridiculous that is? This is how ridiculous that is. Because you know, at a certain point, Satan gathered a third of the angels of heaven to make war against God. You know what happened? Satan and the angels were thrown out of heaven. They were defeated even before the story of the book of Genesis began. They were cast down. They were defeated. And make no mistake about it, remember, they were angels. They are powerful beings. But yet, these people, human beings, albeit together with Satan, human beings nonetheless, saw fit to gather human armies to wage war against the holy almighty God, the Lord of the armies of heaven. You know how ridiculous that is? It's like an ant challenging Mike Tyson to a boxing match. It is just ridiculous to think about. But when we are so enticed with sin, that is what we do. We think that we are strong enough to wrestle with God. And this is how God responds to them. Uh, Revelation 16, verse 17 to 21 says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her, notice this, drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found and great hailstones about 100 pounds each fell from heaven on people and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. They were made to drain the cup of the wine of the fury of God's wrath. On Jesus, it was drained, right? On Jesus, God absorbed his wrath so that he might forgive people. But if we would rebel against God, then God would drain the fury of his wrath on us. Thinking that we are strong enough to fight with God is an illusion. Thinking that all our resources can thwart God's plan, make God make God bend to our wills. This is all an illusion. God allows us to wrestle with Him for a time, but there will come a time that God, with a snap of a finger, would drain the cup of His fury on people who are rebellious against Him. Remember this passage we talked about before? Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too uh, had a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the altar, and the angel who had authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth, and gathered the grape harvest of the earth, and threw it into the great wine press. Of the wrath of God, and the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. And that is 184 miles or 296 kilometers. Uh, As high as a horse's bridle would be around uh, 4 to 5 feet. And um, 296 kilometers, I googled that, is about the distance between Silang Cavite and Baguio. So imagine that distance from Silang Cavite to Baguio. 
and covering that distance, imagining it is just a, a plain field, four to five feet of blood. Such was the fury of the, the wrath of God. He takes on these people who think that they can go against him and that think that they are a match to the power of God and he just puts an end to it. At a certain point, God says, enough. Remember, God's wrath is God's holiness manifesting a seething anger against sin and evil. God gives us time to repent. And so here's the counsel of Scripture. Romans 2 verse 4, Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. You know, when God, when God gives you time, you know, sometimes, you, you know, gives you time to repent. At first, you celebrate that. Thank you, Lord, for another day that you have given me to live for you. But when you procrastinate, you no, know, you forget about the kindness of the Lord. You delay and you delay and you delay. At a certain point, time is up. In the words of our high school, no, finish or not finish, pass your paper. This pandemic is a wake-up call with just one snap of a finger. Economies collapse, jobs are lost, health is failing with a snap of a finger of God. And this is all put to an end. An old normal has gone. A new normal is beginning with just snap of a finger. If this is not enough to wake us up to the wrath of God, I don't know what will. But at the, at a certain point in history, something worse than the coronavirus would come. One snap of the finger, God would just lay to waste all the armies of the world. He would say, enough. So do not procrastinate. Do not presume on the kindness of God. God is kind. He's giving us time right now. But this kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Five things about the wrath of God. It comes from the fullness of God's glory. It is in view of Christ's finished work on the cross and the freedom that comes along with it. God is faithful to execute justice. And that is why it's so foolish to be in rebellion against Him. So let me just leave you, leave you a couple of thoughts. First is the question, does God matter to you at all? Or are other things that matter most to you? Is God the one that matters most to you? Is He the one that occupies the most space and the most mass in your life? Does He matter to you? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus yet? Have you really con contemplated about the finished work on, of Christ on the cross? If not, would you give your life to Jesus today? There is freedom. There's freedom in Christ. Are you really living a life of freedom right now or are you going back to life of slavery? God is faithful to give justice. So wait on the Lord. God hears our prayers. He will respond. Maybe we cannot see it, but that doesn't mean isn't, it isn't coming. Those who wait on the Lord will renew His strength. And it is foolish to rebel against God. God will never bend to our will, so we might as well bend to His. So these are heavenly hope, I hope, perspectives on the wrath of God. I pray that we would see God not only for His grace, but also for His justice. God is a God of justice and He's a God of mercy. And on the cross, His forgiveness and His wrath meet. So would you surrender your life to Jesus now? He had made a provision for your sin, for the forgiveness of your sin, and for your freedom in Him. He is faithful. He is so faithful. Would you give your life to Jesus today? That's a decision only you can make. It's as easy as saying yes to Jesus and forsaking everything else. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a clear picture of who you are. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Yet, Lord, you will not clear the guilty. And thank you, Lord, for giving us a way to be cleared from our sins with Jesus dying on the cross. So, Lord, help us now to grab that opportunity to cling unto that cross where the wrath of God is satisfied. Help us to cling to the cross, Lord. Give our lives in total surrender to you. Thank you for absorbing the penalty for our sin. And, Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that we would not be too proud to think that we can stand naked before your wrath. 
Help us, Lord, to give our lives to Jesus at this moment. Help us to say yes to you. Would you deal with each and every one of us in your in a very personal way at this moment? And if there are people here at the sound of my voice who haven't surrendered their life to Christ yet, Lord, I pray that this be the day of salvation as we see your wrath. Lord, to you be all the glory, Lord, and dominion and power and authority. You are worthy of all praise. You alone are worthy. You are you alone are holy. You are just and you are true in all your ways. Lord, we surrender to our life, Lord. We turn away from our sins, Lord, and we beseech you and we ask you, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to live a life of freedom in Christ. Would you convict us now through your wrath? Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Jolt us into repentance. Thank you for your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Still a man.